Hello, after a long break, welcome back to the third and the last part of a Compute Shader Destruction System series. This time we'll be calculating collision with a Compute Shader and also we will make some improvements so we can handle more demanding cases. Quick reminder, you can grab the whole project from the GitHub, link in the description of the video. Before we begin, we will need a function for copying a texture without usage of the material. So let's do it now. Firstly, I'm declaring a starting function in a header file and I'm also adding it to the interface. I'm adding implementation to the beginning of the file. So now let's return to the project. Now I'm gonna show you how I am using it in the blueprint. I made a new function with collision from origin texture. What I'm doing here is I'm creating a new render texture that matches the size and the format of the origin XM texture. Then I am copying the data using the new function that we just created. Then I am clearing the map of integers and spheres collision components. It's gonna be used for disabling the spheres components at the runtime. After that, I am doing the basic for loop operation, but for that, I gonna need element index variable. This double for loop setup will allow me to iterate each pixel of a texture. Since RGB means location and alpha means scale, I will need to make a new transform with these values. To make the scale match, I need to multiply it by 0 0.01. After making a transform, I am making a new collision sphere that is parented to this blueprint. After that, I am using setup collision macro that will apply proper collision settings. This is very basic collision setup. What I am doing here is that I am setting the channel to destructible and I am ignoring all the channels except the pawn. The new created spheres are added to the map with their index so I can identify them by their element. At the end, I'm adding the one to the internal element index variable. I also created a very similar macro for setup collision for the main mesh. Since we want control if our main mesh gonna have dynamic collision, I am doing a little bit of branching to tell if it's gonna block pawn or not. The main mesh is also have to block visibility, no matter what. The rest of the channels are ignored. Let's now test setup collision for the sphere in the construction script. The sphere seems too much. Unfortunately, I have some problems with using this method in the construction speed when I am in play mode. Because of this, I am using it at after begin play, which is not ideal, but the proper implementation will require much more programming with C. I will also use the setup collision from main mesh. If we're gonna test it now, it should block our player but without disabling the collision spheres. Let's go back to the blueprint and let's make the macro that disables the sphere at the given index. This is how we're gonna branch the collision behavior. What I'm doing here is that I'm checking if the number of collision sphere elements is greater than zero I'm also checking if provided number of index to disable is greater than zero. Then I iterate each given index to find a corresponding element. And then if given element is valid, I am destroying it. Before we continue, let's connect the setup collision from main mesh to the public boolean variable. So now we can control if we want to disable the collision in the runtime. 
So we having the functionality to disable the sphere at the given index. But we still don't have this information for the compute shader. So we have to implement it now. We will start with having two new int buffers. One will hold the number of chunks disabled and one will hold the array of indexes to be disabled. We will need a function to return the index of a disabled chunk. The easiest way to do it is converting two-dimensional index to one-dimensional index. Now let's increase the chunk to disable count with atomic function when it's heated. For this, we will be using atomic add. That will give us currently increase of the buffer. Fortunately, it has second overload method that will return the index before the addition. Now we can use our two-dimensional to one-dimensional index conversion, but for this we will need the width, so let's pass it now. The last thing we need to change is to reset the chunks to the sample count. Now let's make changes to our abstract. It will hold the number of chunks disabled and array with indexes. I'm also creating the constant expressions int with max chunks to disable. It is also a good practice to make the constructor for abstract. Now let's bind chunks to disable count to the reset buffers. Let's also bind the two new buffers to the animate chunks. Now I'm creating chunks to disable count buffer and chunks to disable. Notice the chunks to disable count is only element of one and the chunks to disable count is the size of the max chunks to disable. Now let's bind new buffers to the all necessary pass parameters. Now I am using the buffer readback that we commented later. I am doing it for the both buffers so I can read data from them. Now let's use our runner function and pass buffer readbacks. We also have to check if we are ready to grab data from. Declare our abstract. Pass it with async callback. And then read the bits with the log function. Notice that I am casting it to the wind. I'm doing the same thing with chunk indexes. Now let's iterate through each index and with casting we can assign them to the out indexes in the struct. Notice the readback is clamped to the max chunks to disable. After assigning the data we can unlock all the readbacks. After async task is finished we have to delete the readbacks. With everything in the place, we can test it in the project. Making the usage of our new code is pretty easy. All we need to do is grab our abstract, break its components, and use our macro to disable the chunks. everything done correctly, we should have interactive collision now.
it may look that we are done, but there are still some issues we have to address. For now, we don't do multi-ray check. So, when we hit a wall, we only check the first wall. To do something about this, we need compute shader to return the out hit point and do multiple compute shader calls. To make this possible, we need to make some modifications. We will start with a new compute shader kernel that will calculate the extraction from the hit point. It seems like the first thing to do is to add the hit point to our abstract. But in fact, we don't need the hit point, we only need the hit distance. I'm adding the input hit point for the past parameters and to make it more compact, I'm also adding the boolean if we are assigning the hit point. The same variables have to be added to the action based class. What I'm doing here, I'm passing the helper method that can be used by the animate chunks by the hit point or the array. Let's make use it in our execute pivot painter destroy class. Notice that I am passing the Boolean variable if it is hit variant or not. With newly created helper method, I'm making the very similar blueprint function that accepts the input hit point. Let's not forget to pass the new variables using the dispatch parameters. Let's go back to the compute shader. Making the new variable with optional input hit point. And also making a new kernel that is very similar to animate chunks, but it will accept the hit point. The only difference is that it's not calculating the hit point by the depth test, but this variable is passed manually. To handle our new kernel, we'll make the copy of global shader animate chunks you will rename it to pivot painter destroy animate chunks by hit point change the array origin to input hit point and as always, let's change the defines of the num threads. As always, we also have to implement global shader. Let's make the past parameters and check if shader is valid. Now some branching depending if we are using the hit point. We also need to read the bits from the closest hit buffer. So let's add another buffer readback. To the lambda of our run function, I'm adding the new readback and our dispatch parameter. I'm also adding the hit variant. Checking if buffer is ready is also important. We will need array length. You can grab it using the size method. Now we need the heat distance in the float. Luckily, the C++ and Direx uses the same standard for the float, so we can do the same decoding. So we now have the heat distance if the object is heated. But if no heat was found, let's make the heat distance with the maximum rail length. Do not forget about unlocking and deleting the new readback. So now let's take a look on changes I made in the blueprints. 
First change, as you see, is that abstract now returns the heat distance. I'm using this heat distance to check if it is greater than zero. And if it is, I'm triggering the event sphere heat from weapon component. And if it's not, I'm triggering the event is heat from the same component. For both events, I also casting the reference to self. So now let's take a look at the miss heat event. What we are doing here is basically a recursion. I have a list with actors to ignore. In the clear ignore actors, I'm clearing the array. The macro is triggered at the button press. And to the list, I'm adding the actor from the miss hit. So if we use line trace by channel, the actor will be ignored. Here I'm doing the basic check and casting to the pivot painter destroy. And if hit is exceeded, we trigger a hit event. And if it is not, we clearing again the actor's list. Back in the pivot painter destroy, let's take a look at the sphere hit event. Here I'm using out hit distance and the normalized raise vector to calculate the exact position of the sphere that radius is equal to the spread distance. Then I'm iterating through each hit result. If casting is success, I'm triggering sphere hit for each heated blueprint. Sphere hit event uses execute pivot painter by hit. On the end of the iteration, we clearing ignore access again. So now let's test if everything works as intended. First thing to check, multiple wall hits. Also, the wall seems to destroy the neighbors. And as previous, we can still jump on it. To make it look a little bit pleasant, we made a simple ray power fix. It has three components, basic ribbon, particle emitter at the end, and light component. I am touching it to the socket at the beginning plane of the weapon component. Also using projectile offset and the socket rotation to get a normalized direction. And I'm using action shoot to Enable or disable visibility of PowerFX. The heat distance is also useful to set the laser edge at the Niagara PowerFX. And this is it. Now we have the proper collision and we can deal with multiple objects in the way. As always, I remind you, you can download the whole project from the GitHub if you get lost at any moment. And if you have any questions, I will try to answer them in the comments. On the end note, I have some afterthoughts. Even if our plugin looks good now, there are still some things we can improve. For example, saving and loading the collision for the dynamic destruction can be better handled. Also, it will be possible to make in Unreal tools so we don't have to prepare the models using Houdini or Blender. If you will be interested to contribute to the tool, give me a message. I will be more than happy to provide some help. Thank you for the all people who managed to go for the whole series and I hope I will see you in the future.